Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop and this is a Windsor chair. Yeah, I said I was never going to build one, but uh, here we are. So let's dive in. I honestly have no desire to make a Windsor chair. It's one of those styles that just, it doesn't intrigue me. I don't know, call me odd, but uh, yeah, I don't really want to build one. But when all of the difficult work is done and it's just a straight kit, well, I, I can put one together. So today we're gonna to be making a Windsor chair the easy way. This is a kit from Colonial Homestead and I'll try and leave information down below. So we're heating up the high glue. And we're gonna have a little bit of fun. I'm going to be using high glue on this, particularly old brown liquid high glue. It works really, really well. Um, it's a little bit more solid than I'd like it to be, so I actually warm it up in a pot of water to try and get a little bit more uh, runny. I don't want it to be really runny, and uh, later on in this project you'll see where I let it get a little too, bit too warm and it got too runny. Um, and so I want it to be slightly jelly, but uh, um, actually going on there well. You could use a brush to put it on a little bit better. Um, I do want to do a dry fit on all of this and make sure I know exactly where all the pieces go before doing the final assembly. And then when it comes time, you spread in the glue and drive it all together. One of the nice things about high glue is it's finished transparent. Most of the time with a chair, uh, I try and do the finish first and then put it all together. And that way it's so much easier to work on. But with a Windsor chair, you can't finish it first because a lot of these pieces have to go through and be trimmed off. So you have to finish after it's all been glued up. And with a high glue, that makes it very, very, um, very, very usable because the high glue is finished transparent. So the finish won't um, become really blotchy on that. Now, in this case, I'm using milk paint so not quite as important, um, but if I was using any particular type of oil finish, that would be very important. For the base, it's easier to slide everything in, get it where it should be, and then pound it together. I flip it over so that the base is up and then drive the base down on the legs, as opposed to driving the legs down into the base. It makes it a lot easier when you're not uh, trying to pound it into itself. And then for all the rest of them, use a clamp to pull everything tight onto the spindles and get them exactly where they need to be, work the base down all together. For the wedges, I'm going to be gluing one side of the wedge and not the other. Uh, this allows a little bit of expansion and contraction inside there. Uh, you don't need to glue both sides, but if you'd like to do that, then do so. Just make sure when you're driving them in, you drive in nice and straight and uh, don't let them bend over and snap on you. Um, don't ask me how I know that because, uh, yeah, wedges can split out on you and go, oops, like that. Yeah, um, in that case, try and lift it back up and drive it down in and get them down in as far as you can. The wedge is really what holds it. The glue is kind of the, the temporary bond that is the backup for the wedge. For the back, we're going to start with all of the spindles, and it's very important to make sure you know exactly where every spindle goes because they are all different heights. Uh, they get taller as they get closer to the middle. So we're going to glue and drive those in, get them down as far as they will go. And then we can start in on the, the back being bend. Uh, this is the tricky part and it'd be really good to have a second hand in here. Unfortunately, I did not have a second hand uh, because my second hand was holding the camera. We want to make sure we get glue on both the mortise and the tenon of every joint. And here you can see I had let it warm up a little bit too much and it became drippy and started running down. Uh, it became a little more difficult at this point. It'd be good to have a brush and work it onto all the spots you want. And yes, it'd be very good to have a second hand to work these in so you can work them from one side to the other. Uh, it takes a bit of work, but with the right application of force, uh, it goes down in. Um, you, I, and this one, I actually ended up, I caused one side to go in all the way, and the other side, I didn't quite get it in all the way before it set up, which was a little sad, but it was in far enough it works, and you wouldn't know unless you were actually looking at it. For the wedges on the top, you can start by splitting them a little bit with a chisel, and then you can drive them in. You'll notice on the two outside ones, the, the bow um, tends to split out, and so you might need to clamp that back to support it. This is the one that went through all the way, and I can drive in the wedge, and then the other side was the one that did not go in all the way, which was very sad, uh, but it went in far enough I can get the, the wedges in and lock it in place, and it's not going to come out. And Unless you're looking at it, you probably wouldn't notice it. And make sure you break off 
all of the wedges. <laughs> Once it's all set up, we can come back and cut off all the excess. We're going to stay as close as we can uh, to the main surface, but I don't want to take it down all the way. I could use a flush cut on this, but I really haven't, uh, I don't like using that on rounded surfaces. It's easier to cut close and then come into the chisel and pare it down right down to the surface. Uh, the chisel just gives you far more control. Use it beveled down and you can get a really nice clean surface and uh, almost exactly what you want. And then you can come in with a card scraper and do that final detail to get it right down to it. If the surface allows you, like on the outside, you can use it bevel up, but most of the time you're going to end up using it bevel down, uh, particularly on the seats here, um, because the, the, the rounded surface just makes it very, very difficult. I found if I sat on the, the, the seat, it made it a lot easier to chisel it back, and then we can card scrape it out. And these, uh, it's one of these very pleasing things when they all come in. Yeah, I'm chiseling towards myself. Um, I know that I'm not going to overpower it because I'm using a mallet, which is um, the safe way to do it. But we're going to chisel in and then pair out and then chisel in and pair out and chisel in and pair out uh, until we get it down close to flush. And then I'll sharpen it up a little bit more. And then we can do the final cleanup on it and get it down right flush to the seat. After that, a little bit of card scraper work and everything is very, very pleasing. Uh, I love being able to get that smooth transition from the leg into the sole. We're going to do some of the cleanup on the glue that's squeezed out, coming in with the chisel, bevel down, bevel up, wherever it needs to go, scrape out any of the extra gunk uh, that comes out, and then we can start doing all of the, the finish work on this. Here you can see that was the one side that didn't go in quite far enough. A good card scraper is phenomenal with the inside curve and being able to clean up the spindles all the way down them and uh, give you that really nice um, smooth surface you want, uh, especially when glue drips down and uh, gets into things. Scrape all the surfaces, get all of the glue um, excess off of them, and get everything very, very pleasing. And uh, yes, I do use a card scraper a ton on this. It is amazing how much um, you can do with a card scraper on a flat surface um, or a rounded surface or an interior cur curved surface. Um, you can really get some nice, clean surfaces. I usually come in with the chisel first and get rid of the majority of it, and then I'll come in with the card scraper and scrape it down and off. And if I really wanted to, I could come in with some uh, uh, sandpaper and make it buttery smooth right before um, we add the finish. Uh, but in this case, the, the card scraper is all you need. We're going to start off with real milk paint. Um, this stuff works out really well. Um, I've used a couple different types of milk paint in the past, um, and I kind of like this one. I got a chance to try it. It comes with a jar with a marble inside, and you mix it up one to one. So I was using a quarter cup of pigment and then a quarter cup of water, and the nice thing is that marble inside, you can mix it up, and you have a container ready to do it. Um, it actually is a, a kind of a cool system. You just want to make sure you let it sit for a little while after mixing it up. You want the paint to fully soak into it. Well, that was sitting aside, I figured it'd be time to cut off the bottoms. I'm actually going to cut off about three quarter inch more on the back leg uh, because I want it to recline just a little bit. Use a pencil to mark off of a flat surface and then cut down to your line. And then we'll want to chamfer the edge over a little bit. We don't want to leave the, the rough open grains uh, for them to split out in the future. But with all four legs cut off to that mark we drew, the chair should theoretically sit flat if the ground is flat. But very rarely is the ground really flat. Um, so yeah, we, we, we want to cut those off, uh, the back ones off a little bit shorter um, after it's been all glued up because if they're all the same length, we want it to recline back a little bit. I hope that makes sense. I'll come back in with a uh, rasp foreign hand and file and just chamfer over the bottom edge a little bit and that will uh, protect it from sliding against the wood. Now that this is set, we can open it back up and ooh, I like this navy blue. Um, milk paint is an incredible art um, to get something just the way you want it. Um, this, uh, yeah, the, if it's a flat surface like a bookcase, it goes really easily. On this, it's, it's really difficult because there are lots of different edges and angles and different spiles. And uh, I ended up doing uh, one coat on it and then sanded it smooth with a 400 grit um, and then came back in with a second coat to try and smooth it out. Um, and yeah, milk paint is, uh, it's a pain. It's a very, very difficult finish to get right. And it is something that I have not mastered. I've done it 
ah, five or six times. And every time it's one of those things where, oh yeah, I could do this a lot better. You could spend your whole lifetime really mastering milk paint and, uh, and have a, a fun time all around. Um, but this one, especially when you get into these rich colors, you tend to get um, a color variation difference uh, from batch to batch. And so you need to be very careful to do all of it in one particular batch. And then as it dries, it changes colors. This one almost went from a, a purple to a blue, uh, which is really hard to pick up in the camera. The, the color matching on that uh, didn't go very well. But you want to get it all on there and then you want to come through and smooth it out with a brush. So you want to get it into every nook and cranny and then come back in and, and clean up those ridges. Um, a light, light sanding afterwards just to uh, smooth out the surface does some amazing work. You don't want to leave it just with the milk paint on the end, otherwise it will wipe off onto your clothes. So I'm actually going to be using um, a top coat finish that will go over it. I'll leave links to both of these down in the description below if you want to see specifics on them. Uh, but this will actually seal it in. It's kind of like a Mod Podge um, or a water-based poly, um, in which you could use either of those on top of it. Uh, but this one's a little bit more of a, a traditional soak on. You uh, soak it on, get it on all the, the, the surfaces, and then wipe off the excess before it dries. And it leaves you with a really nice matte finish and brings out a little bit more of the tone you want on the surface. So it's not perfect, but I really like it. And uh, yeah, it's incredibly comfortable. Windsor chair. So there you have it, uh, a Windsor chair. Uh, yes, making it from a kit makes it so much easier uh, and simpler and less monotonous. Now, I know there are a lot of people who absolutely love making Windsor chairs. It's a whole style that is beautiful and enjoyable. But for me, it's personally one that I just, I, I don't get that much enjoyment out of it. Um, but each to their own. So a kit is a fantastic way to do that because all of the boring part is done and now we can do the assembly and have a chair. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you want to find out more about the kit, I'll leave information down that below. They're from Colonial Homestead and he does an amazing job of putting these all together. It's a hickory back, a uh, poplar seat, a maple, a maple spindles, um, just really, really beautiful and uh, I really like how this came out. He also now offers them in a single piece seat so they're not laminated, which I think is really cool. Um, very hard to find that, but uh, very, very, um, very, very cool. So click the description down below and you can find out more information on getting your own kit so that you can make one the easy way too. As to the milk paint, um, milk paint is one of those fun traditional things and I like the way it came out in this one. I kind of tried to make it a little more distressed in between. Uh, it didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to, but it's not bad. And I kind of like the historical feel to it. It does give it that nice um, je ne sais quoi that also goes along with the Windsor look. So I kind of like that though. I think if it were me, I would probably just do a simple finish on it, uh, like a hard wax and let the wood speak for itself. But yeah. Not bad, I kind of like the blue. So I hope you like this video, making a chair from a kit. Uh, this is getting to be a bit of a standard for the show. So we'll see where it goes from here because I'm not a huge fan of making chairs, but making them from a kit, that's something a little different. If you do have any questions, thoughts, ideas, concerns, things I could have done better, things I should know about, let me know those down in the comments down below. I do read through all of them and I answer as many of them as I can get to, and that's usually most of them. So thank you for that. Putting a comment down below does help out the channel, as well as hitting the like, share, subscribing, commenting. Thank you. That does get us in front of more people. It helps the channel grow. It's just an all around good thing. If you want to take it one step farther, there are a bunch of names scrolling over here on the side. They are all the patrons on Patreon. They are the ones who are literally keeping this channel going because we would not be here without patrons and members on the channel. Uh, people who financially support this channel are the ones who are keeping us going. We are completely sponsored by the viewers and I like that. So if you'd like to find out more about that, there are links to Patreon down below or you can click the little join button down there and become a member here on YouTube. And we have special perks for both and behind the scenes things. So I hope you like that. And I think that'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. So I've done a chair kit from Matt Cremona, a chair kit from Colonial Homestead. Hmm, what chair kit should I make next? Or maybe I should just make a chair. Nah. Thank you.